Jesus wrote to seven churches in the Asia Minor coast. That would be Turkey, Greece area in our modern uh, geography today. Of those seven churches, he corrected five and commended two. Corrected five and commended two. Of the two that he commended, I want to take a look at one. The church at Smyrna was a suffering church, and Jesus commended them. He partially commended them because they were not complaining, even though they were suffering, a lesson all of us can learn. Revelation chapter 2, verses 8 through 11 reads this way, And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, The words of the first and the last, who died and came to life. I know, I know your tribulation. I know, I know your poverty. But you are, yeah, wake up the person next to you. But you are rich. And the slander of those who say that they are Jews are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. I know that. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested. And for 10 days, you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. The first death is on earth that all of us would experience. The second death is an eternity without God that none of us want to experience. The church at Smyrna was a suffering church, but a commended church. They were commended in large part because they were not complaining that they were suffering, but they were still leaning on the everlasting arm of God. And John was called to write to these churches because they were going through difficult times. And when he wrote to the church of Smyrna, can you imagine the good news? Though they were going through a difficult time, when they heard that this letter is being addressed to you by the one who is the first and the last, the one who was dead but is now alive. That was the first encouragement he sent them. I know what you're going through, but I'm alive. Secondly, he says, I know, I know. I know your tribulation. I know what you're going through, and I know what you're about to go through. So not only was Jesus writing them to let them know he was alive, but he was also writing them to let them know that I'm aware. Isn't it good? that the one who sits at the circle of the universe with all power of heaven and earth in his hand is aware. That was good news to them. But then there was something else that he wrote them. He not only said, I'm alive and aware, but he let them know that I am active. I am acting on your behalf. You're going through suffering. Satan is going to throw some of you in prison. You're about to go through more suffering, but it will only be for 10 days, a limited amount of time. If you be faithful, you will have a crown of life. Isn't it wonderful to know that he's alive, that he's aware, and that he's active and active on our behalf? I don't know about you, but when I get a letter like that and I know what I'm going through, that's great news. And we can do that each time we read the Word of God. He's saying the very same thing to us. We have much to learn from our global partners. And so I want them to come forward, and I want you to hear with your hearts what they have to share with us on here today. Let's appreciate to applaud the Lord as they come.
<laughs> Wonderful. And no one's gonna wipe this smile from my face for a very, very long time because it is an absolute honor to be able to introduce you to these global outreach partners. I'm gonna start, even though you've met him once, he is worthy of twice. I'm gonna introduce you to Andre and Angie Forges. They are the founders of A Place of Hope in Haiti. Their mission is to invest in the long-term efforts that help prepare children to lead the needed change in Haiti by providing a safe home for children, quality education, including a deaf school, vocational training, faith-based values, and life skills. They've been a partner for over 10 years, and they've been nurtured by our Hope Ambassadors, Christy Dickey and Laurie Meyer. Amen. Next, we have our dynamic mother-daughter duo, Ruth and Joyce Lomo. They are the founders of Ebenezer Global Hub, located in Uganda. Their mission is to provide holistic care to refugees and the host community through leadership and skills training so that they can excel and become those change agents in their communities. They have been our partner for over five years and have been nurtured by our Hope Ambassador, J.D. Ballinger. And last but never least, our partner, Oscar, practicing the R's, Aguirre, our co-founder and executive director of Pan de Vida in Ecuador. Their mission is to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ and meet the immediate needs of the less fortunate in Ecuador by providing hunger relief, education, health, shelter, microbusiness, and emergency relief. They've been a partner for over four years and have been nurtured by our Hope Ambassador, Gary Adams. So let me start by asking you to tell a short story about uh, God's work in your community. How has God been working in your community? Let's start with you, Andre. Well, when I was dating my wife, this beautiful woman here, um, she lived a quiet distance from me. It's about three hours walking. So every Saturday, when I go to see her, and there was a beautiful land at the top of the hill, I said, well, man, if I have money, I will buy that land. I will build a church, an orphanage, school, clinic. That was my dream. If I can't afford like 50 cents to take a bus, how come I get the money to buy, to buy a land? Well, after a few years, we get married and we come here and we get a call from her brother-in-law. Um, tell her that uh, they're going, there's a land for sale. So my wife told me that. I said, well, we don't have money because I'm here with an expiry visa. It's hard for us to get, to get a job. So we live basically in the one bedroom, my family and my four kids, because we can afford to rent anything. But in the same month, I got a job at the storage place. And then people dump a good stuff in that dumpster. <laughs> and I said, well, if I can get some and then, you know, and sell them. Well, I start selling them in some for $1, some for $5, $3. You know, I put the money aside. After a few months, I went to the envelope. Guess what? There's $4,000. Amen. Amen. That's correct word. So I ship it to Haiti, put it down deposit in the land. I'm telling you, the land cost me $70,000. The only donation I got just $1,000. All those money come from the good things in the dumpster. We got the land, we got the orphanage, we got the church, we got the school. You know, we got everything that the Lord was listening and everything was exactly the way I was taken. Thank you. Amen. Bless you. Amen. Thank you. All right, now, <laughs> you said you walked three hours to visit her every Saturday. Well, yes, I walked three hours to, to visit her. 
three hours go and three hours back. That's six hours. You know what? <laughs> six hours for eight years. She make me wait for eight years. <laughs> Every Saturday, three, six hours. But you know, in the end, that's worth it. It's Amen. A wonderful woman. Amen. It's a woman of God. And he helped me a lot in my ministry. Amen. Thank you, darling. <laughs> All right, tell us a short story, Miss Ruth. Yeah, I was forced to flee my country, South Sudan, in 1990, and then came to uh, Uganda, stayed for five years, and then went to Kenya. In 2001, I got the opportunity to be resettled in the U.S. I came to U.S. a single mother with five children. I was working uh, minimum wage, and I have friends from Second Press who enrolled in my children in East S private school, putting together scholarships, tutoring them, helping them with their homework, so my children were able to graduate all from college. With that much love, I want to share my story with other people. I went back home to give back to my community, to help those who are back then by, like me. So in 2017, we started youth leadership training because youth are the next generation. We started under a tent, but today we have a guest house that provides accommodation, that provides training for youth, and also we have a pastor's training as well. So I was thankful for how God is faithful, and I want to share his faithfulness with other people. And that's my mission. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm particularly grateful. Hold on. Just, I'm just grateful that some people come to America and get stuck, but you went back to help other refugees like you were as well. Thank you. Yes, because it's how much you bless, and it's how much you bless. Amen. Bless you, man. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Oscar. I work with Pan de Vida, Bread of Life, in Quito, Ecuador, for 21 years. Um, before the pandemic, we were able to attain around um, 200 people every week with food, with fresh food, hot food. And around 600 families were connected to our ministry. Ecuador was one of the hardest hit countries in the world with the pandemic especially Guayaquil in the coastal area, uh, the health system collapsed, the funeral homes collapsed, the cemetery collapsed, families ended up with their loved ones um, in their homes or in the streets for days. It was terrible. At the moment, one of our ministry partners, Samaritan Sports Canada, called me and they requested that we could help Guayaquil. We don't have an office in Guayaquil. It's eight hours away from Quito. Um, I told them, I think you have the resources. I, I'm going to be an obstacle rather than a blessing. And they responded back and said, Oscar, we have worked with you for over 20 years. We know you. We know how you work. So you don't help. We might not be able to help at all. Mm. At that very moment, I talked to my wife. We prayed. And it was very evident God wanted to use us. I told my local staff, you take charge. I'm going to help these people in Guayaquil. And God put a, assembled a team of ministries together. And we were able to reach to 11,500 families with food, with the Word of God, a Bible, and a prayer. Mm. Hundreds, if not thousands, opened their hearts to God. And God transformed their lives. Today we have um, connected over 2,000 families connected to our ministry. We have over 195 families starting a micro business. Last month, a team from Hope was there, and we were able to reach out to 20 families with small projects. Praise the Lord. Amen. Thank you. Beautiful. Love it. So name a, a big misconception that we in the West have about missions. Just a big misconception or understanding. Okay. I think one misconception that we have is that missions is a calling or that you have to be uh, super spiritual or have a special gifting to be able to do missions. And the reality is the Great Commission of Matthew 28, 19 through 20, 
applies to all of us. If you call yourself a believer, the moment you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you have accepted the missions and you have accepted the calling. And I want to read a quote by John Piper, and he said, there are three kinds of Christians when it comes to work missions. The zealous goers, the zealous senders, and the disobedient. And the question is, which one are you? Because the reality is, as I was saying, all of us do have a calling. And all of us who are sitting here, and I'm sure people who are involved with missions, if you ask them, all of them don't feel like they're qualified to do the work that God has called them. And the reality is, when you get to a point where you feel like you don't have what it takes, or you feel like you're not qualified, that's the exact place that God wants you to be in, and you are the perfect candidate that God wants to use for His glory and for His kingdom. And then for those who aren't able to physically go, there's many ways to be involved. And the Lord has brought the nations to Memphis, Tennessee. So I always tell people, if you can't go, you can help support a person who has the heart to go. Or you can invest in people who are here, who have the heart, and who have ministries in other places. And also, I want to encourage all of us to take the time sometimes to invest your life and surround your life with people who don't look like you. It's so easy for us in the States to just stick with our own people that we are comfortable with, but the reality is God has called us. And as you involve yourself with people that don't look like you, you will realize how much bigger the gospel really is. Mm. And so a lot of times it's easy for us to look at ourselves, but I'm encouraging you to look up. When you look up and take the focus away from you, you're able to see the brokenness around you. You're able to see, and that God is able to move in your heart. So. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. One of the other biggest misconceptions is that missions are not necessary for local evangelizations, and yet they are. Mm. You know, if, if we think in terms of eternal salvation versus eternal condemnation, if all the effort we put into certain teams and doing whatever we can to reach out to people, uh, you know, if we can save one more person, it'll be worth it. Mm. You know, I've seen all these teams come in and many, sometimes we think that it's, it's church planting what we need. You know, we need to realize that a lot of people are not going to seek church. Therefore, when we have ministers like ours, Pan de Vida, that reach out to their communities, we are bringing church to them. You know, we are meeting them where they are at in a very tangible way. You know, I remember with the last time we were there in the, in the lands of Otavalo, in an indigenous city in Ecuador, and I remember the, the Hope team members in the rain sharing the gospel with these children. And they were singing. Oh, they were singing. Mm -hmm. We need more efforts like that. You know, that mission team, the missions transform us as well as transform them. And they are fun. So I will encourage that everybody, everyone goes. I will encourage that you continue to seek opportunities to go out out of the comfort zone and reach out to these people that otherwise may not know Jesus. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, sir. Well, I heard the people said, um, God didn't call me to become a missionary. But this statement is maybe biased because everyone can be used in the term of the mission you know, if you, uh, some can't um, offer prayers while the others, you know, give to the cause of the mission. So in doing so, they should be equally involved in the mission by the way they support. Um, this is an example. My wife, this beautiful woman here, she is a spare in soup. She makes good soup. But when she started soup, first there's water. And then, if that's an example, I don't know how to cook, but I just give an example. <laughs> so I came and put the salt in the water, still water and salt. But some other person come and put it, potato. The other can put chicken. The other put, um, um, Carrot, thank you. Yeah, I told you, <laughs> the other put carrots, you know, and that's when the soup is ready. There's a nice smell, flavor. So what we do with that flavor? 
how we get it for ourselves, we don't deserve it. That flavor is going directly to, to, the, to the one who gave his life for us, to Jesus Christ. So what I'm saying that is to say that everyone here could be involved in the mission. The day that you enter in the God family, immediately you become a missionary. Whatever you pray, whatever you send a, a card or a gift or you give, you will be equal of those who are in the fears. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. Beautiful. Amen. Thank you guys so much. Can you all next share a positive impact for those sacrificing going on a short-term mission trip? Well, a short-term um, mission is just like a, a double-edged saw. It amazed me to see how much short-term team accomplished just a few days. I really see the team who pour so much love in the work at Place of Hope, especially the team coming from here. I'm telling you, Pastor, when they go to, when they reach Haiti, to Place of Hope, they are walking the day one. They are walking. What's so amazing about that is they haven't been in Haiti for four years because of the political situation in Haiti. But the work didn't stop. They touched the kid, how to do the bed, and uh, the chair, painting, and sewing. Mm. I'm telling you, they keep doing this. Suppose they didn't do that. The kid have to wait for four years doing nothing. You know, so this is a great team, and I really proud of them. They teach our kids, so that will help me and my wife not to spend money and the material or people to to come to do the sewing for us. So they do their own uniform, they do their own work. Thank you so very much. Amen. To God be the glory. Yeah. Uh, I would say. Um, Short missions are very impactful because a long journey starts with one step. And the short missions is that one step that you need to take. Uh, for example, we had uh, missionaries from this church, John Long and his wife and Jedi and other group of people who traveled for 24 hours from here all the way to Uganda and they went down to Bidi Bidi, but only spent less than six hours, not even a whole day. They just went there to listen. Sometimes we saw, I don't know, I, I don't know what to offer, but they just went to listen. We brought together pastors and their wives. They just listened, and no answers. So when the left people say, so what? I say, I don't know. But today, that less than six hours visit have planted a, a seed, which they are enjoying the fruits. We have the pastor's training. We have finance training for them to manage the program. And also we have management and leadership training through that time. So I'm saying it starts with a step. And you have to be willing to take that one step with your faith and with your heart. And that's what God will do. God will do the rest. Thank you. So you're saying three or four days of travel, less than six hours of just listening, is still paying dividends today. Yes, that was just, I mean, it is a crumple, and then it was something that we didn't know what was going to come, but God used that, and God was able to do what he has to do. So God will do it all. Amen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think short-term uh, missions are really powerful. First of all, because they bring fire. When a team comes to our local ministries, they bring fire. They fuel our energy. They renew our energy. I remember after the pandemic, the first team that came, it was so moving. It was so emotional. You know, we felt you care for us. We cry together. We serve together. 
when they, they are based on true partnership, when uh, you learn from us and we learn from you, and God is glorified, they are super powerful. When, when you see also the possibilities of your local church growth because of this, and I remember one of the teams that came, the relationship ended up in one of our staff members going back to the States to an internship, two-month internship, where she was able to contribute to the local church with ideas in how to serve Latinos in their area through their ministry. The same time when she came back to Ecuador, she was able to share with us uh, different ideas and new ideas how to implement in our ministries. Now, as a bonus, you know, this particular lady ended up marrying an American, <laughs> and now they live in North Carolina, which is a wonderful thing that happens also in these international relationships. It's been good, it's good to step out of your comfort zone. It's, it's good to focus on a, a true, uh, and prepare the teams in a true, uh, humble spirit, servant spirit, uh, uh, focus on evangelization in gospel, living out the gospel. That really changes not only the lives of the locals, but also the, pe the, the lives of the people that are going in the, in the short-term teams. Thank you. Amen. Beautiful. Yeah. blessing of going for a week or two. You all are in that work every day, so bless you for the work that you do. Yeah. Earlier, Pastor had talked about the afflicted church, so our last question is, what is one lesson that the affluent American church can learn from the affliction of our godly sisters and brothers in your country? Well, um, as you already know, we hit by so many disasters, Hurricane, Ed Creek, uh, one day, there's a one time, there's a hurricane um, destroy most of the houses and the village where the orphanage. We are the only uh, concrete building. So we have a mass of family come to take refuge at the orphanage. We get probably 50 um, family plus or 60 children. I didn't have any plan, you know, for for the 50, the, the, the little food we have just, just to pass by. Well, when I see my kids are eating and looking at the other children, you know, they just look like a kid eating, I feel really bad. I feel bad. So I say, Lord, you know. So I share the food we have uh, with them. Then we don't know, maybe after a few days, you know, the food is finished, and then the Lord knows. But I got a call from uh, one member here of the church. He said, hey, Brother Andre, how are you? I said, I'm, I'm okay. He said, how is the situation in Haiti? I said, not good. What do you need? I said, food. He said, okay, how, how can I send some money? I said, throw a San Nino, you know, and send me $2,000. <laughs> this is the answer of prayer, man. man. <laughs> $2,000, remember from the church here. And then the Lord provided. We bought food, so everybody was eating and no problems. And the other things, and our church roof was out, destroyed. But on Sunday, we have the mass people come to church. It was um, sunny. But after a while, there's rain coming. Everybody get wet, but they didn't leave the church. They tried to protect the Bible, and they aim not. So they want to focus and praise the Creator. Amen. Thank, Thank you. you. Amen. Wonderful. Thank you. I want to start by sharing uh, the verse Matthew 19:24 which says, again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. And one way that I begin to really understand this verse, because I've been here for over 20 years, is when I started to travel back home, and I began to see how back home a lot of people are materialistically poor, but they're very spiritually rich. And then I come here, and I see how a lot of us here are materialistically rich, and that's nothing wrong with the materialistic things, but a lot of us are also very spiritually poor. 
And I remember even just back home when people are going to church, sometimes you'll because people don't have transportation, especially in the refugee camp. So you'll have people walking sometimes 45 minutes one way just to get to church, whether if it's in the rain or the sunny days or because they have a heart to want to be in the house of God. And you also have people that, as you see them walking, they're carrying their chairs with them on their heads because when they get to the church, there's no chairs in the churches. And if they have churches, if they have chairs, it's just logs on the floor that people are sitting on for hours and hours because back home there's no time limit of how long church lasts. You just know what time it starts, but you never know what time it ends. And even, even after it ends, people don't want to leave because people... Oh, 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 man, hello. <laughs> Did you say that people walk to church in the rain? Yes. And they're not worried about getting out an hour and 10 minutes? Not at all. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> not at all. And that's, and that's very convicting for us. You know, that's very convicting. And it's just amazing even seeing how, like, even in the midst of the struggles, in the midst of the affliction, one thing you can tell that the people have is joy because the, the joy of the Lord is truly their strength. And we've also seen how even in the midst of affliction, the church, is, the church is there are thriving and people are doing great. And it's just a reminder for me that sometimes, because I can do that too in the U.S. especially, I want to pray afflictions away. I want to pray the pain away. But sometimes I can pray away the blessings that God wants to bring through that affliction. And so one lesson I will say is that sometimes we can allow money and materialistic things to really get in the way of our walk with the Lord and our devotion with Him. So. Amen. She wants to keep my microphone. You know, I think whenever you are faced with, um, with the need or the tragedy or the affliction face to face, it really changes and adjusts your perspective. And I want to start with, uh, with this story. Um, we receive new cases to help every month, the first week of every month. And last week, I received this picture from our social worker of a couple that was sleeping on the sidewalk outside our facility. There was a, it was an immigrant, immigrant couple that was covered with, by a plastic sheet and waiting for us to open our doors. Mm. They have arrived at 5.30 in the morning. We opened at 9. We immediately acted. We gave them breakfast. We, we've gloated them. And for, for them, that day was a day of salvation. Mm. That made a difference. So it changes your perspective. In Ecuador, we have been through a lot of afflictions the last six years. We had... The earthquake, 7.6 degree earthquake that devastated the coast of Ecuador. Then we had the massive pandemic from Venezuelans coming from Venezuela. Uh, 1.5 million people in 2018 and 19. I mean, our streets were flooded with them. Wonderful people, but in extreme need. And in 2020, we had the pandemic. I mean, with all that, you should be complaining, right? No, we have learned to be resilient. We have learned to be, you know, to be faithful in prayer, to know that God will provide, to persevere, to be in our knees. So if one lesson, I would say we need to change our perspective. We need to put our eyes in the things above. Sometimes the needs that we believe that are needs, they are not so. There are more, our bigger needs that are more spiritual. And we need to rely on Jesus to provide for them. Thank you, sir. Amen. Amen. Let's uh, appreciatively applaud the Lord for our partners. Thanks for joining us today. We love to pray for you and celebrate alongside you. Please share anything going on in your life with us at HopeChurchMemphis.com slash prayer and subscribe to the Hope Church Memphis YouTube channel to experience previous worship services and more. Have a great week.